I'm going to talk today about evaluating alternative intervention approaches to dyslexia. The conventional approaches that you get um, really tend to rely on the fact that we've now got a lot of evidence that most children with dyslexia uh, have problems in what's called phonological awareness. That is, they don't necessarily hear all the different sounds in speech and therefore have difficulty relating them to letters uh, when they're trying to read. And most of the interventions that are mainstream these days would focus on trying to train children to identify sounds in words and relate them to letters. <coughs> but this sort of intervention has been shown to be effective and there have been a number of large-scale studies. But nevertheless, it has to be fairly prolonged for some children and for there are children for whom, even though they can learn this way to actually sound out words and read, they don't necessarily read fluently. It's still an effort and, and they don't sort of get the degree of automaticity that you might expect. And it's certainly the case that methods that work for many children don't work for all children. And there's a hard core of children who remain very hard to treat. And it's for this reason that many parents do get very concerned about whether there's something else they should be doing if they're finding that their child is either not getting intervention or that the intervention doesn't seem to be working very well. <clears throat> and there are a whole load of um, things out there that are on offer. And the problem for parents, I think, or indeed for adults who themselves might want to have further intervention for dyslexia, is that they want to know, how do I distinguish something that might work for me from something that's just a sort of snake oil merchant who's out there to make money? And that's what I want to try and address today. Um, principally from the perspective of how you might evaluate uh, scientific evidence that people put forward. But perhaps before going on to that, um, it's worth just sort of going into some relatively common sense things. Um, I would say there are certain things that should ring alarm bells if people are advertising some sort of treatment for a child with dyslexia. Uh, the first is that if the intervention was developed by somebody who has no academic track record, uh, no experience of doing research in this field and hasn't published anything in this field. Um, if the intervention isn't endorsed by people in mainstream dyslexia field, that should also sound a note of caution. Of course, the mainstream people aren't always right. It's possible that somebody with no background will develop something marvellous. But if that were the case, you would expect it to be pretty quickly picked up by people in the mainstream who are really, on the whole, pretty keen to find things that will work. And you obviously want to look at whether somebody's asking for a lot of money for something that hasn't been proven. And what is also, to my mind, a, a worrying sign is if somebody promoting a treatment is relying heavily just on testimonials from individuals who claim to have been cured rather than having any sort of proper scientific evaluation or clinical trials. And it's worth noting that <coughs> human beings have a tendency to be terribly impressed by testimonials and even myself as somebody with a scientific training I find if you know I've got headaches and if somebody comes along and says I was cured by such and such and I went to my herbalist and it worked you know you're, you're often very tempted to be much more swayed by that sort of evidence than by a page full of numbers and figures and this is just a human tendency we're naturally built to really take advice from other people and to rely on what they tell us but in the context of these sorts of interventions, that's really quite dangerous because when somebody gives a testimonial, that's just one person, their own individual experience, and the people you don't hear from tend to be the people who tried it and it didn't work. And you don't know how many of them there are. There may be thousands of them, but they're not going to publicise the fact that they tried it and it didn't work. And so testimonials are often very much at odds with um, more scientific evaluations. But I want to turn now to say, well, when somebody says there is scientific evidence for what they're doing, how you should interpret that. And that's jolly difficult even for the scientists sometimes. There's disagreement, let alone for the general public. But again, I think there are some sort of general rules of thumb that you can go by for telling if a treatment is likely to be effective. Um, <clears throat> and when I discuss this, I'm going to illustrate it by taking uh, the example of the door treatment, that's D-O-R-E, uh, named after Winford Door, its, its uh, originator. Um, and I'm picking on this largely because it is a non-mainstream treatment that isn't widely accepted by the experts, and yet it does claim that there is some scientific evidence to support it, which has led the scientists to look at it quite critically and quite carefully, which is what we will do with any scientific evidence that comes along. Uh, 
once it's out in the public domain and published, people tend to go and look at it as carefully as they possibly can. Now, um, the door method is interesting to us because it does illustrate the case where there's disagreement as to whether the evidence is showing that it's effective or not. And so what I want to explain is why it is the case that despite this published evidence, most of the experts are not impressed with the efficacy of the door treatment. Uh, but the general points that I'll make would apply to any other treatment that was out there where there was evidence being produced. So first of all, what is the door method? Well, it's a method that is, uh, has been proposed for curing problems that are thought to originate in a part of the brain called the cerebellum, which is at the back of the brain. And it was developed by Winford Dorr uh, as a method for helping his dyslexic daughter. And he has written a book about the history of how this came, to, came about. And he was a classic instance of a parent who was rather desperate to help his daughter, who for many years had been through the educational system and failed, and was getting increasingly depressed. And he tried various things. He talked to various experts. And he ended up with this program that's been put forward, which is an individualized program where the child follows various sorts of exercises which are done for about 10 minutes twice a day uh, over quite a long period of time, varying depending on the severity of the problem from maybe six months to two years. And the child is assessed at regular intervals and different exercises may be prescribed. Now the theory behind the door method is that um, dyslexia and other learning difficulties, it's not just dyslexia it claims to help, but also attention deficit problems with dyspraxia, are thought to arise within the cerebellum. The cerebellum just doesn't develop normally. And the argument is that you can have different cerebellar impairments in different people. That's why you can get this range of different symptoms. But that you can diagnose them by specific tests of mental and physical coordination. <clears throat> and what you're then supposed to do is these exercises uh, which are not anywhere fully described uh, in the public domain because they're commercially sensitive, but there are some examples given, and it's clear that what they do is focus largely on training balance and hand-eye coordination in children. So you might be asked to stand on a cushion on one leg um, or to <coughs> throw a beanbag from one hand to another while you're doing that, to stand on a wobble board and balance, or to follow something with your eyes in a particular way. Um, so the idea is that these are all things that the cerebellum is involved in, and by training up the cerebellum, you may improve its general abilities. So what's the evidence for this underlying theory? Well, it's not a proven theory, uh, but there is some support for it. Um, certainly, people trying to look at what's going on in the brain in dyslexia have proposed many different uh, theories about what the underlying causes might be. If you look at the brain in a brain scanner of somebody with dyslexia, it typically looks totally normal. There's certainly no big holes in the head or anything like that that you're going to see on a scanner. But the argument has been made that there may be regions of the cerebellum that are perhaps slightly smaller than they should be, uh, or not functioning quite as they should be. And this theory uh, has some support, although not everybody would agree with it, and there are certainly other theories uh, equally plausible at the moment that are around. The notion that the cerebellum is important for getting things automated, so you can, when you learn to drive a car, first of all it's very slow and effortful and you have to think about everything you do. By the time you're a skilled driver, it's no longer the case that you have to do that. You just drive around without even thinking about it. You can do all sorts of other things while you're driving. Um, so the argument is that with reading, most people similarly become very automatic in how they learn to read. You do it without thinking about it. But that for the dyslexic, it remains effortful because the cerebellum is uh, not functioning normally and it's the cerebellum that helps you get your skills automatized. Um, and in support of this, it's been argued that in many people with dyslexia, there are some associated problems with motor coordination and more physical uh, skills and so on. Um, and that too could be a sign of a problem with the cerebellum. Again, that's fairly controversial. It's not been found in all children, and uh, the arguments go to and fro. But this is not a sort of theory that is, is particularly uh, disapproved of by in the mainstream. People are debating it. <coughs> the difficult stumbling block, though, for the door approach to treatment comes with the idea that if you train the motor skills, that is the sort of 
coordination between different muscles and movements and between the eyes and the hands, uh, that this will somehow have a knock-on effect on things like reading. Uh, and indeed, um, David Reynolds and colleagues who published this initial study on, on the treatment described it as something of a leap of faith because the cerebellum is actually known to be a very complicated organ with lots of different regions which are fairly independent from one another. So there's no real reason to suppose that if you train one part of the cerebellum it will have somehow a generalised benefit. And indeed you could say, well, if it were the case that this was true, if you had a child who was good at skateboarding or playing ping pong or things like that, that they, sh or perhaps of ballet dancing, things that require balance and coordination, that should protect you against dyslexia. And there's really not much evidence for that. On the contrary, there are some very good sportsmen, who, gymnasts and people who are dyslexic. So it's hard to see how the logic of saying, you know, train these motor skills and somehow the whole cerebellum function suddenly improves. <clears throat> but what does the published evidence look like? <clears throat> because the theory might be, um, you know, questionable, but basically what the parents are going to say is, what matters is, does it work? Well, there's a published study on the intervention which claims that it shows that it really does work if you compare children who have the intervention and children who don't. And uh, two papers have been reported, one of, from an initial phase of the study and the another from a subsequent phase, uh, and they're reported in uh, the journal Dyslexia, which um, in 2003 published a paper, the first paper, which was on just under, um, started with a sample of just under 300 children who were all attending um, a regular primary school. And the researchers went in and screened all the children on the dyslexia screening test to pull out children who would be suitable for enrolment in the study. Now the first thing that's more important to note is that these were not ch uh, children who had a very high rate of diagnosis of dyslexia. So there were 35 in the group and about a third of those came out as having a strong risk of dyslexia on this dyslexia screening test. Another 21% came out with a mild risk, but about half of these children were not really even in the risk category, um, and they were just picked because their scores were relatively low to the, compared to the other children. And there were only a total of six children who had previously been diagnosed as dyslexia out of the 35. There were a couple with a diagnosis of dyspraxia and one with ADHD diagnosis. So this is not really a sample consisting of children really with severe problems on the whole. There were a few in there with major difficulties. Nevertheless, um, the originators of the treatment would argue even quite mild problems might be worth treating with this, and so you could argue this study is nevertheless of value. So what they did, they started out well in this study. They divided the children randomly into treated and untreated groups, uh, which is, as I'll go on to explain later, is, is an important part of a good study. And if you look at the results that are described on the promotional materials for the Daw organisation, or in Daw's book uh, that he's, he published called Dyslexia, the Miracle Cure, um, he described the results as stunning and said that reading age increased threefold, comprehension age increased almost fivefold, and writing skills by what he described as an extraordinary seventeenfold. Of course, anybody reading that thinks, wow, my child's going to take off like a rocket if we put them on this intervention. But unfortunately, this, these figures are really a classic instance of, of how statistics can be manipulated in a very misleading way. <clears throat> so, for a start, they were not based on any comparison between the controlled children and the untreated children. Sorry, the controlled children and the treated children. They were, <clears throat> instead, they just took all the children who had been treated and uh, looked at how they did on a group reading test that had been administered by the school uh, every year. And the children had had this on two occasions prior to um, the intervention, so three months before it started and a year before that, and on two occasions after the intervention over this whole long four-year period. And what the researchers did was to really just plot the average scores of the group um, over these four time periods and show that if you compared the amount of change from the first time point to the second, which was before they'd had any treatment, uh, it was a certain amount. And if you then 
compare the second to the third time point, so the treatment had occurred in between those two, it, uh, there was a different amount of change, and then they divided one by the other and showed that there was this threefold improvement. But it's a very, very misleading way of depicting these data, because if you look at them on a graph here, you can see that the only odd thing about the data, well, there's two odd things about the data. One is that at most time points, these children are reading at absolutely normal levels, so it's not clear why they are regarded as having risk for dyslexia. And the one time point where they're not is the time point three months before they're enrolled in the study, where there is a bit of a drop. But it's really not an impressive demonstration of change. And this division of one uh, time period by another is very misleading because it, it just gives a double weighting to this one low um, period of three months before the treatment started. And they did the same thing again with these other figures of massive increases that they talk about, uh, using data from the SATs, tests administered by teachers, which are not really regarded as particularly precise or rigorous tests, and um, really group children in a fairly global way uh, at level two, three, or four. And level two is average for a seven-year-old, three is average for a nine-year-old, and four is average for an 11-year-old. And to give you an idea of, of the sort of misleading nature of, of these massive changes they talk about, um, on the writing test, where there's this incredible change that they talk about of a 17-fold increase, um, the score at age 8, the average score was 2.5, which is about what you'd expect for an 8-year-old. At na age 9, it was 2.56, which is a little bit better, but not much. And then they argue the intervention came in, and at age 10, the children scored uh, 2.95. They're still rather below where they ought to be at the age of 10. It looks as if on this particular writing assessment, the children are just rather creeping along. But because the difference between 2.53 and 2.56 is uh, less than the difference between 2.56 and 2.95, uh, they make a big computation of dividing one by the other. Actually coming out with the number 17, which is wrong, the number is actually 13. So there's a 13-fold change, but if you look at the raw numbers, this is really not an impressive gain at all, and it's really a very misleading way of presenting the numbers. So most people would say this is, this is really um, smokes and mirrors in terms of using statistics in a way that isn't really valid. <clears throat> the other thing to note is that all these results that have given so much publicity in, in promoting the treatment about these massive changes haven't talked about the control group at all. They've just talked about, well, we've got these children, and before treatment they did this, and after treatment they did that, and it's all gone up. And of course, if scores do go up after treatment, it's not necessarily because the treatment worked. There are lots of other reasons you need to bear in mind. And the first of which is just, on some things, you'll get better just because you get older. Um, so that if you were to measure shoe size before the door treatment and after it, it would go up but it wouldn't mean that it made your feet grow bigger. Uh, now, clearly, that's a silly example in most cases because people try to use measures that don't necessarily change with age or that are adjusted in some way for age. But it's important to bear that in mind when <clears throat> people are talking about changes on things like the door programme. They talk about changes on balance, and balance improves dramatically as after the programme. These are measures that have not been adjusted for age at all, and so some of these changes could well be due to the fact that the children are getting older and getting better at doing the test because of that. <clears throat> Another uninteresting reason why scores may improve is that children may be having some other sort of special help. Um, so if a child is having reading difficulty, they may very well be getting some special help in school in addition to following this programme and uh, that could be what's causing the change rather than the particular intervention you're interested in. What's very well known, of course, is the placebo effect, which is a sort of concept coming from medicine, which also says that you can get better just because you think you're going to get better, because you think somebody's done something effective. Um, and in the case of educational treatments, you can see effects where, because the teachers and the parents and the children themselves are all full of expectations of how this is going to improve them, there's more motivation, everybody gets uh, positive attention, and this itself can cause positive effects. <clears throat> the fourth reason, which is often neglected, but in, it, because it really doesn't affect things in medicine so much, but in education it's actually rather important, using the sort of things like reading tests, you can have practice effects. 
So you can get better on something just because you've done it before. And we've seen this quite a lot with um, language tests, for example, that we give to children, where the first time you test a child, they don't know what to expect, they don't know what's coming, you ask them to do something, it's unfamiliar, they're a little bit nervous maybe. Uh, you test them again on the same thing a month later, they're much, much better, simply because they've done it before and they're calmer about it, they know what to expect and so on. Uh, so you can get practice effects that are, uh, can, uh, can have make quite a difference just because you know what to expect and you are familiar with the whole situation of the test. <clears throat> the fifth reason, and the last one you'll be pleased to hear, why people may improve for no good reason, uh, is the hardest to explain. And it, it's, it's something known as regression to the mean. And it's just a statistical artefact which has to do with if you pick somebody because they're bad at something, the odds are, when you test them on a second occasion, they'll be a little bit less bad. The converse is also true. If you pick somebody who's very good, they tend to get a bit worse when you test them a second time. Why should that be? Um, the reason that this occurs is because our measures are not entirely perfect and accurate. I'm showing a graph here where um, we have a measure that is almost perfect, and you test people on two occasions, and you just will see that their scores on time one and time two are identical. We're assuming that there is no genuine change. If you do that, then you don't get regression to the mean because the, the measure is perfect and if you test them a second time, they'll get exactly the same sort of score. And what you can see on the right-hand side of the graph here is people divided up according to, what their, according to the average score they started with. So we've put people into groups who were very poor to start with, who were medium, less good, and so on. And these are just fictitious data made, uh, made up to illustrate the point. So you just generate these numbers by saying we've got a measure that has um, <clears throat> this particular characteristic that it, you measure it on one occasion and another occasion it remains pretty much the same. So then you don't get regression to mean and you get people maintaining their position across time. So if you then see change, you can say, well, it's, it's genuine change. But most of our measures are not like that. Most of our measures are not perfectly correlated. That means you measure them on one time and another time, and they actually change um, because of all sorts of things, um, things like the particular test items that you're using, uh, whether you're in a good mood, whether you make a lucky guess in some items. Um, and what you can see is that if you do that, that some people's scores go up with time, some people go down with time. But on average, um, if you start with a low score, the odds are you'll come a little bit closer to the average uh, when you are tested on another occasion, if you start with a high score, you get a little bit worse. And this is nothing to do with genuine change, it's just to do with the fact that our measures are imperfect. And it's been argued that this is a major reason all sorts of treatments work, but don't really work. It's just that uh, it looks as if you've seen a change and you tend to attribute it to treatment. Now, this sounding fairly depressing because it means... There's all sorts of reasons why we can see change and how do we distinguish whether we've got a genuine change due, due to our treatment. But the fact is that you can control for most of these things if you do a study that has a control group. And that's why um, those who are trying to do scientific evaluations are really keen to include control groups in studies and argue that they are essential. Because if you have another group of children who've been selected to be as similar as possible to your treated group and are given the same test before and after the period when the treated group are treated, you are actually controlling for the effects of maturation, the effects of any other intervention they might be having, practice effects in particular, and also this dreadful regression to the mean. All of those things can be then taken into account. And insofar as they have effects, what you would expect to see is that you may see improvement in your control group um, because of these spurious things that we don't really want to see. And then you can say, well, is there more improvement in the treated group? And it's that difference that is really critical. <clears throat> it doesn't actually control, uh, to use, if you have a group who's not given any treatment, it doesn't control for placebo effects. So you've still got the problem that maybe your treated group will improve just because everybody's focusing on them with great excitement. But you can actually also control for that, and it's becoming increasingly popular in this field to say that what you should have is a control group who are actually given some alternative treatment. So, for example, if you're interested in a treatment that might improve reading, you could either give children the sort of standard educational treatment they're getting anyway, so you get them a, if, if your claim is that you're doing better than a, 
phonological based treatment, you could have a control group given that treatment and see if you really are making that much of a difference. Or you might prefer to say, well, let's treat something else. Let's give children training in something completely different that isn't focused on reading, but nevertheless could benefit them in other ways. And then you can do that sort of comparison. So what about the door study? Because I mentioned at the, first, at the outset when talking about this study that they did have a control group. Um, but so far, talking about the results, I've only mentioned the dramatic changes that they saw, which ignored the control group. Um, the interesting thing is that when, the, when you look at their control group, it illustrates perfectly the importance of having a control group. So on their dyslexia risk score, where a high score is bad, they had um, a change in the treated group from 0.74 to 0.34. So you think, wow, that's great, these children's risk for dyslexia has really come down. In the control group, the average score changed from 0.72 to 0.44. Now you could say, well, it's not as big a change. The trouble is, with groups this size, you can't really tell whether that is meaningful. Uh, but certainly what is clear is that both groups improved on the dyslexia screening test, even though the control group had not had the intervention. Um, so it really illustrates the point very clearly that on a lot of these measures, everybody gets better, even if they're not treated. <clears throat> now, if we look at the more precise data that they presented, they presented average scores on the different subtests from the dyslexia screening test. I won't uh, talk about all of them. Um, I have got a fuller presentation where I do talk about all the different measures they used, and I don't want to sort of be accused of deliberately hiding things, but I think the tests that people would be most interested in are the literacy tests. So you, you undertake the door treatment because you want to get better at reading and writing if you're a parent of a dyslexic child at any rate. So looking at the results on those tests, um, what they found was that there were a total of um, four tests uh, that had to do with literacy directly, and on one of those it looked as if the treated group did better than the untreated group. The, there's a problem with that though, because on this reading test, the, um, uh, untreated, the control group were actually right on the average score for their age at the start of the treatment, uh, the, 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 at the start of the study. So, in a sense, you could argue, is there really room for improvement? They were obtaining a score absolutely average, whereas it just so happened that the children who had treatment started a little bit lower and therefore were, um, had more room for improvement. And their improvement was not dramatic, one has to say as well. The score went up from 3 to 3.5 on a scale of 0 to 10. Um, on the other measures, again, it illustrated that on two of them, uh, Everybody improved, regardless of whether they had the treatment. Uh, and on the third one, nobody changed very much at all. So this is not dramatic evidence of, of improvement, but you could argue, well, nevertheless, there was one measure that looked a little bit promising. But they then, in the second phase of the study, went on to give the control group the same treatment, and they published this in 2007. So we now don't any longer have a control group. So everybody's been treated, one group early on, and the other group with a delayed uh, time scale. And they pre presented the data between t uh, time one at, at the start of the study and right at the end of the study when everybody had had this treatment. But when you look at the results there, it's clear that there really is uh, you know, no persistent improvement in, in reading. In fact, the mean scores for the ch children having delayed treatment on the reading test have marginally gone down rather than up at the end of treatment. And the general impression I would say is, is that there's nothing very stunning going on here, certainly nothing that matches the description that you get uh, on the uh, promotional materials for the intervention. <clears throat> so overall, I would argue that the evidence for gains associated with this treatment is really not at all compelling. First of all, the claims that are made for stunning changes are all coming from uh, uh, analyses where they didn't incorporate the controls and they just tried to argue that any change you see over time must be due to the treatment, not taking into account all these other factors. And on reading measures, um, where there was control group um, data available, there was an initial small gain in the <coughs> treated group, but it wasn't sustained by the end of the study. <coughs> so it really doesn't look terribly promising. <coughs> now, this is, this is why, in general, I think it's true to say this, I don't know of anybody in the um, dyslexia community 
who is an advocate in the academic community who is an advocate of the door treatment other than people that are directly associated with the door organisation. Um, and so the reason really is just that the evidence is, is not at all compelling. Um, although the study was small and you could argue a larger study should be done, um, there's a real mismatch between the claims that are being made and the evidence that is available. But the interesting thing is also why so many people seem to nevertheless regard this as an effective treatment. If the testimonials are to be believed, there are many satisfied customers and, and happy parents who feel that their children have been helped. <clears throat> I think there's quite an interesting set of reasons why this may be so. And one is that there's a well-known in the psychological field, well-known human tendency to think that something that you've put in a lot of time and money to was worthwhile. It's called cognitive dissonance, and it means that if you've actually um, put in the effort, you tend to feel that there was an effect. Uh, you have to somehow resolve this sort of inconsistency otherwise in your mind. And this was beautifully illustrated, not by the uh, a trial of the door treatment, but in another trial, which was a very nicely well-conducted trial of something called sunflower therapy, which is a rather holistic uh, approach to intervention for dyslexia that involves kinesiology and physical manipulation, massage, homeopathy, herbal remedies, and neuro-linguistic programming. And th there was a very rigorous study done for this, um, and uh, what was interesting about it was that like so many of these things, they didn't really find a lot of evidence for any better uh, change in the clinical versus the control group, although to some extent both groups were going, their scores were improving. What they did find though was that the children themselves had higher self-esteem if they'd undergone the sunflower treatment, but that also 57% of the parents did think that sunflower therapy was effective in treating their child. So there's a clear mismatch between what the study showed the objective evidence on the children's learning difficulties and what the parents actually thought. And it's possible that this could be related to um, the fact that the children's scores did improve, but if you didn't know that the control children had also improved, you might attribute that to the therapy. But also to the fact that people were again um, being given a lot of encouragement, they were a lot invested in the treatment, and there may well have been some sort of uh, sense of cognitive dissonance there. There's also a strong human tendency um, to be impressed by certain kinds of explanation that, that get more biological about dyslexia, particularly those such as the door treatment that get more neurological and claim to be doing something to the brain uh, in treating dyslexia. Um, there was a beautiful study done, uh, published in 2008, not on dyslexia, but just more generally on people's tendency to be impressed by scientific explanations. And um, what these uh, researchers did was to give people explanations of psychological phenomena that are well known, and um, they either gave them a good explanation or they gave them a not very good explanation that was more like a, just a redescription of the, the effect. And they asked people to judge whether this was a good explanation or not. And what was fascinating about this study was that, in general, people were quite good at doing this, even if they had no familiarity with the background or in psychology they could distinguish a, a good explanation from a bad one. But what they found was that if they added some verbiage that just talked about the brain in various ways and said this result came about because brain scans showed it or because we looked at the frontal lobes, uh, people were much more impressed with the bad explanations. So a, bad exp a good explanation didn't get any better when you added all this neuroscience waffle, but if you added neuroscience waffle to a bad explanation, people found it not so bad. Um, and so there is a tendency to be very impressed by anything that talks about, adds the brain into a line of explanation. And I think this is uh, used by people who then try and add spurious neuroscience sometimes to their accounts of their um, particular promising theory. Uh, and it really is, is not, um, it, we, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be misled. So I think to sum up, there are a number of barriers to objective evaluation of uh, interventions which are, are to some extent functions of our human condition that we are, we're not natural, na naturally good at taking in lots of numbers and looking at graphs and 
trying to sort of take into account alternative explanations. We tend to be impressed when we hear other people tell us that something has worked. Uh, and it's hard, you have to almost <coughs> guard yourself against the tendency to do that and to, to look rather for the hard evidence, to look for the actual numerical data. <coughs> we have to be very careful when people start giving us explanations that have got a lot of neuroscience in them and check out, is this real neuroscience or is it just put in there to impress us? <coughs> we have to be aware of, of the effects of cognitive dissonance and the tendency to uh, believe something simply because uh, we, we have invested time and money in it. And, and most importantly, we have to bear in mind that there will be effects um, on children's performance of maturation, of our expectations, of just get practicing on things. And there are also these dreadful statistical artefacts that can make it look as if a change has occurred when it's really not particularly impressive. But I think if one bears these things in mind, the bottom line is really look for evidence from studies that have got adequate controls. And if you do, you'll be uh, astounded, I think, by how far you can see improvements in children, even if they haven't had the treatment. But there are a lot of things that will make things look better just with the passage of time. But if you, can sh if you really want to demonstrate that there's been an effective uh, treatment, you do have to show um, an improvement relative to a control group rather than just that somebody started out not so good and is now a bit better after the treatment. Uh, I hope that that might give you some useful indicators when trying to look at new treatments that are out there and on offer. Um, and for a more detailed account of some of this work, there are various, um, there's a PowerPoint presentation with some notes on my website on this topic.